Happy New Year, everyone. I'm so excited to be sharing my first video of 2020, which features my latest watercolor painting of a peony goddess sleeping in a water lily pond. I'll be using this awesome set from GenCraft, which includes a watercolor palette, paper pad, and refillable water blending brushes. The paper pad is a bonus that's included for free in the set, and it contains 15 sheets of textured paper measuring 5.1 by 9.4 inches. The watercolor palette contains 48 vibrant premium solid watercolors, and each pan contains quite a good amount of watercolor, so it will definitely last you a while. It also includes two refillable water blending brushes, which I'll talk more about in a bit, a sponge to help with making textures, and the palette lid also serves as a roomy place for mixing your colors. Okay, now let's chat about these special brushes. They're similar to a traditional watercolor brush, but they have a hollow stem that you can fill with water. This helps keep the brush consistently damp, and you can control the wetness of your brush tip by applying pressure to the stem, which will cause more water to squeeze out and moisten the brush tip. This feature helps streamline the painting process by giving you more instant control over the wetness of your brush, but you can also use these brushes the traditional way by wetting them in a jar of water and then wiping them off on a paper towel. Whenever I get a new set of watercolors, I like to start off by making a swatch of every color. I found that the colors always end up looking a little different on paper than they do on the packaging or in the actual pans, especially when you dilute the colors to make a semi-transparent wash. So, in order to avoid being surprised during the actual painting process, I like to make a swatch first and then use that swatch as a reference when choosing colors for my painting. If you'd like to try out these awesome supplies, GenCrafts is offering a 15% discount for all my subscribers. You can find the link in the video description. Okay, moving on to the painting process. The concept for this piece was from one of my older drawings from 2017 titled Sleeping Peony, and I wanted to breathe some new life into it by adding color as well as some more details. I started off this painting by sketching out an underdrawing with a red erasable colored pencil. I prefer to use colored pencils over regular graphite pencils because it's inevitable for me that the watercolor will end up mixing with some of my pencil marks, as I'm still quite new to this medium and I haven't figured out a way to work around that yet. So if the water is going to mix with the pencil anyway, I might as well leverage that to my advantage and use a pencil color that will help my painting rather than detract from it. And since I want the mood for the piece to be feminine and romantic, I thought red would be the perfect foundation for it. Using graphite would have resulted in a muddy gray mess for me. Since paper has a limit to how much wear and tear it can tolerate, I always recommend using light pressure first to sketch out the underdrawing so that it can be easy to erase if you make mistakes. And then, once you've finalized where everything is going to be in your composition, go back with a stronger, bolder stroke to outline those elements. And now it's time to start adding color. I'm sorry it's taken me a while to get to the actual watercolor portion of a watercolor tutorial video. In general, I like to approach watercolors with a similar method that I use for oils, which is by working with layers. I like to start off by establishing a color blocking layer just to fill up the surface area of the paper and get an initial first look at how all the different colors play together. Through my somewhat limited practice, I also discovered that a drier brush will yield a more concentrated opaque color and a wetter brush will result in very diluted and faded washes. So for the darkest, most expressive features of the face, such as the eyes and eyebrows, I will use a drier brush to pick up pure black paint and establish the darkest points of the piece. With the darkest value laid down and the lightest value being the white of the paper, I now have two visual anchors of the most extreme limits to my values. By starting off with the upper and lower bounds, it helps me fill in all the midtones in between so that they can transition elegantly from dark to light. With watercolors, I'm always paranoid that I will end up destroying the paper, so I load up a wet brush with a tiny bit of paint to lay down a light wash, and then immediately I use a paper towel or sponge to soak up the excess moisture. 
In my experience, this has helped prevent the paper from warping or distorting too much. Overall, for me, the color blocking layer is meant to serve as a foundation to build upon, as this layer in its current state looks a little bare, with each element only containing one flat color. The leaves are just green, the flowers are just pink, and the sky is just blue. The next layer is where I actually harmonize all these elements so that they work together as a whole composition. The second layer is where things start to get more fun, but also a lot more challenging. The goal for this layer is to not only polish up and refine the details, but also to make the piece harmonize. What I mean by that is I want every element in the painting to feel like they belong to the same setting. I want everything in this composition to feel aware of each other and play off of each other. Initially, when the flowers, leaves, water, and human subject were each a different color, it almost felt like I cut and pasted these separate elements together in a collage. Instead, I am now starting to introduce some traces of one section to the other sections. I'm adding some of the green from the leaves into the shadows of the skin tones. I'm incorporating some of the pinks of the flowers into the leaves. I'm adding some of the blues in the sky and water into the highlights of the face and the flower petals. Basically, I want it to seem like the light is bouncing off of one object and it's being reflected in the rest of the adjacent objects. This will make the piece feel more cohesive and also just more interesting. For example, if you only use shades of green to paint a leaf and only stick to shades of red to paint a flower, the end result is something that looks very flat and manufactured. Mixing up different colors and sprinkling them around the entire painting actually helps convey an illusion of realism. The third and final layer is where I put down the finishing touches. I discovered that if you use a mostly dry brush, you can pick up the white watercolor paint and use it to layer on some highlights, almost the same way that you can use gouache or acrylic or oils to paint lights on top of darks. Though obviously with watercolors, the coverage is a lot more limited, so I would only recommend it for little highlights and finishing touches, not for actually layering the light colors on top of darker colors to build the bulk of your painting, as watercolor is not the best medium for that. But through this piece, I did discover that there is a way to layer with watercolors. It's just a little different from layering with oils. With oils, you can cover up some of the layer underneath with new paint, but with watercolors, it's more about tweaking or adding to the layer underneath. There's less room to erase once the paint has dried, so each brushstroke must be done with care and intent. I also learned that besides the first color blocking layer, you really shouldn't wet your brush too much. Too much water will not only wear down the fibers of the paper, but water will also spread quickly and uncontrollably to adjacent areas of the painting that you might not want to be disturbed. So for most of the detail work, my brush was about the same dampness level as your hair after you've showered and wrapped it up in a towel for 20 minutes. This helps you have more control over your line work and also retains the opaqueness and saturation of your paint. I can sometimes accidentally stay in this final stage for way too long because there will always be a part of the piece that needs more refinement, there will always be a little imperfection that needs some polishing. Unless I force myself to put down my brush, I can just keep going and adding to the final 1% of the painting for longer than it took me to complete the initial 99%. But as for this painting, we are finally coming to the conclusion. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope this tutorial was somewhat helpful. If you'd like to see a more comprehensive 30-minute version of this tutorial, I have that posted on my Patreon, along with hundreds of hours of exclusive tutorials and rewards at patreon.com slash happydartist. I have both the original painting and print listed in my shop, and for the first 10 orders, I'm including a free mini print of the Sleeping Peony drawing as well. And if you're interested in learning more about how to paint and draw, I have lots of art educational content on my Patreon page, including exclusive video tutorials, step-by-step -step photo tutorials, live streams, podcasts, and even surprise art gift boxes. All available at patreon.com slash happydartist. I'd love to have you join my Patreon family. 
Also, if you want to check out more artworks, works in progress, and just random daily artist adventures, feel free to check out my Instagram and you can follow me at the handle at happydartist. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!